Well, volume nine had an epilogue. I already reacted to the epilogue on my stream, but I figured I could make this video in case you didn't want to watch the whole live reaction. Give you a more put together review. Oh, hold on. I've prepared for this moment. OMG, guys. This is so sad. Oh my god. Is this the... I'll, I'll use this for my thumbnail. This shot of me looking sad and crying. Because OMG, it's so sad, isn't it? <laughs> if you didn't know about this epilogue, well, I can't say I'm surprised. Rooster Teeth has seemingly given up on promoting their shows entirely, even long before the company was announced to be shutting down. Their Rooster Teeth Twitter was labeled inactive months ago, the Ruby Twitter is struggling to stay relevant, and most updates about Ruby come primarily from the personal Twitter pages from Eddie and Carrie, which you know, not a great place to be the only source of upcoming information. Your YouTube channel has millions of subscribers. Announce on your channel that Volume 9 is airing on the Rooster Teeth site. <laughs> Whatever, the company's dead anyways. It's far too late for them now. Originally, the epilogue was going to be hidden behind a paywall, but I suppose they realized not a lot of people are going to be willing to fork over money for a dead company just to watch an animatic. So they changed it, right? Right at the last second. Ooh, we just found out about this. Uh huh, sure. So, the actual animatic itself, much like the rest of Volume 9, it's incredibly meh. It's just a bit drawn out and boring, trying very hard to be dramatic and whatever. But also, it's far from being the worst thing Rooster Teeth has crapped out for this. It's just aggressively mid. The animatic focuses on our main characters monologuing to themselves about how they're holding up after the fall of Atlas. Nora's feeling big sads. <laughs> Oscar's missing Ruby. If there was anything I wish I could borrow from you, Ruby, it would be your certainty. Ren's missing Jean. I never realized how much you did to hold us together. Winter's missing Weiss. You were the true heir to the Schnee name. And Crow's actually in a really chipper mood. Call me crazy, but I'm actually feeling a little optimistic about things. Aw oh man, my two nieces are presumably dead. I'm feeling good, let's have a party. We start with Nora, where we see the team actually fight their way out of that sandstorm from last time. Uh, all it is is Winter yells a bit and then it just all suddenly stops. And they're literally like right next to Vacuo. Cool, we'll just take that conflict and get rid of it right away. No one watches stories to watch our heroes come up with cool and interesting plans to solve their conflicts. They like it when stories just solve things instantly without any input or effort. Oh yeah, all of Team Coffee shows up, but then only Sun and Neptune showed up out of Team Sun, even all the way to the show's death. Kruby can't be bothered to include the gay man or the black man in their content. What kind of groom do you expect to find in the desert setting? Like the most basic, boring, first idea of a Grim. That's right. Grim attacked the city for days. Sandworms, like Dune or Tremors, or everything ever, because Rooster Teeth hasn't had a single original idea in years. Hey, are you ready? Guess who the bad guys are? All of the people of Vacuo. It's understandable they'd be upset or overwhelmed with an entire continent's worth of people suddenly dumped on their doorstep, but nope, they're all exclusively painted as bad. And you wanna know how they do this? By literally having Vacuo civilians throwing rocks at children from Atlas. But not only is it just children, they're orphans. The last thing we need is a kingdom of orphans. <clears throat> the world doesn't revolve around Atlas. What's wrong with orphans? This is like one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. And we just had Blake's cat thing from last volume too. You could just be human or just a cat. What's worse, they don't even give an explanation as to why they're mad at this little child orphan. They just say, we have our own problems. Like, yeah, but be specific. I think most people would be on your side that suddenly being faced with thousands of refugees would put a strain on anyone. That's a lot of resources, space, etc. But don't just say, we have our own problems. It makes me think RT was worried people would empathize with the wrong 
person again because they did such a terrible job with it last time and it caused a big stink in the fandom. So now they've gone over the top having people literally throwing things at orphan children to really hammer home that we're not supposed to agree with these people. It's just so painfully goofy. In the middle of this real refugee war survivor plot, and then here's freaking Disney villains attacking baby orphans, literally. I'm gonna put a pin in this because I want to touch on this topic more again later, specifically when we get to winter section. Just gonna put this out there. According to the ship chart, Nora X Neon is called Valkyries or Sugar Crash. Personally, I think we could come up with something a little bit better. <laughs> It's Oscar's turn. You always believed things would work out. That's called being naive. It's not usually a positive trait. Husband has no explanation of what might have happened to you, your team, Jean. So Oscar asks the literally ancient man who's been walking this world since the dawn of time for answers, and he has none. So obviously, if that guy doesn't have the answers, surely Oscar can find more information in random history books, right? But given Vacuo's history of colonization, its records of antiquity are even worse than most places in Remnant. Oh no. I'm gonna put another pin in this, don't worry, we're going to get to it soon. I just want to address all of it all at once. Oz is fighting our merger just as hard as I am. Oh, I guess this is a thing they can fight now. Ten years into the show. Five years with Ozpin and Oscar together. And only now are we setting up the idea that this is something they can fight off. Sure. You know, it's a real mystery why this company is getting shut down. Everyone worries the next Grim Assault will be the last. Too many people to take care of. Too many emotions. Wow, it's almost like it was a stupid idea to place half of the world in one singular location, in an environment that's already known for its higher grim rates. It's almost like Ironwood planned for this, and this is why he didn't want to tell everyone in the whole world all at once. It's almost like this was a bad decision by our heroes. Oh, but the Vacuans are the ones throwing rocks at orphans. Our heroes aren't the bad guys, the Vacuans are. Okay, now it's Ren's turn. How did you do it, John? How did you go from the boy at Beacon to the leader at Atlas? Well, his friends fight for their lives, don't you understand? <laughs> what is the point of all of this? Will you just tell us what's going on? All oh, with that damn smile on your face to make you pay for what you did? Do you hear me? I'm gonna be real with you, Ren. I don't think Jean handled much of anything well. When you lost so much in between, you know, you lost Pyrrha too, right? Are we just straight up admitting that Ren never really cared about Pyrrha at this point? Yeah, it was hard on Jean when he lost Pyrrha. Hmm? Me? No, I didn't care about that bitch. You crazy? <laughs> Guess what? You have homework to do. That's right. You, the audience. This is Jax and Jillian. Do you know who they are? Too bad, the show's not gonna tell you. They're in a group called The Crown. Do you know what that is? Oh well, read the books, you loser. All the way, right to the very end. You have to buy our supplemental material because we don't know what we're doing. They must have realized that, yeah, just Tyrion, Mercury, and Cinder wasn't really going to be enough of a convincing threat for the thousands of heroes on our team to handle. So let's throw some random other people People in their forces too. At least it's characters who have like a tiny bit of setup. If you did bother to read the books, you'd have an idea on who they are. I guess that's better than coming up with even more characters out of nowhere. Too bad we couldn't set up any of this stuff in the show though. We were just too busy with Wonderland. We just had to have this stuff. We couldn't bother to set up any of the major characters or concepts for the next big step of our story in all of this time. Too busy with our Wonderland filler arc. Just gonna put this out there. According to the ship chart, Nora X Velvet is called Energizer Bunny. That's a good ship name. I like that one. Well done. Okay, we're finally on winter. Finally, calling the Aesops what they really are. Is this the same memorial as the first part with Nora? If not, how many memorials are we going to have? You're dragging all of these people way out into the middle of the desert multiple times? Make the memorial closer to the city, jeez. Because of me? 
Danny is gone. Forever. We want you to create a new version of her. No, I'm gonna actually put that blame squarely on Ruby and Jean's shoulders. Oh my god, it's poor Nublek. The Winter Maiden. Mishni. Oh. I don't know what it is, but this is a terrible performance. It sounds like a person trying to lower their voice, but in a really crappy, not convincing way. Like if I did this with my voice, I'm Peter Port now. I don't know. Get the Overseer's Ruby Abridged version of Port instead. That was way better. Just remember, nobody likes sour milk. She came to Vale. And now there's nothing left. Oh, okay. I guess Vale got completely destroyed off screen. Cool. Great. Yeah. Quick thing. What about this moment in volume eight? This is the store from Dust Till Dawn, a store that we've only exclusively seen in Vale. And I'm gonna be real, it looks pretty decent out there. So this was either a retcon, which would not be new for Ruby, they do that constantly, or did Salem destroy Vale again, even worser, the second time while Ruby was dicking around in the Ever After. Good job, Kruby. Keep on having all that important stuff happen off screen. Super cool. And, uh, this, this is the only place we could think to go. This is such a lazy contrivance. It's a lazy, dumb excuse to have everyone showing up in vacuo. I'm fine with the idea of everyone showing up in vacuo, but give me a real reason, you blundering morons. Later, we see Atlas civilians leaving vacuo on their own, wandering into the desert. We hammered it home with Nora and Oscar's section that all of the civilians being here is causing major grim attacks. Bringing more people here in universe is already stupid. Just fly people to Mistral or Menagerie. Literally, any excuse anyone gives to explain why they didn't go to Mistral or Menagerie is just asinine. Anything. Any scenario. Oh, the overcrowding. Oh, the lack of leadership. It doesn't matter. It would still be better than putting more strain on Vacuo. Oh, but... They're the ones throwing rocks at orphans, so I guess we're not supposed to care about them, right? It's so goofy and stupid. We even see at the end, when Team Ruby is showing up, the sky is filled with tons of airships. Throw some refugees onto those airships and fly them to Mistral or Menagerie, because this is so dumb. Okay, let's address those pins from before. Filthy schnees! Not so high and mighty now, are you? These are civilians of Mantle. You can tell because these two are actually background characters from Volume 8. These are Mantle folk. What's it like living at our level? Okay, so let's lay down everything we've been setting up here. The vacuins are bad people who literally throw rocks at children orphans. You gotta feel bad for those poor Alesian orphans. Then the mantle people are harassing Willow while she's literally just trying to feed more children refugees. She's doing volunteer work. The mantle people are verbally attacking her. You gotta feel bad for those poor Alesian sneeze. And Oscar said that Vacuo doesn't have good history books because it has a history of colonization. Well, guess who colonized it? That's right, Atlas. So correct me if I'm wrong, but is the story they're trying to tell now the story of those mean colonized people who are mean and bad. Don't you feel bad for these poor, poor colonizers? Feel sorry for the colonizers. The colonizers are the ones defending the orphans and feeding the children. While those mean, mean colonized people, mean, mean vacuins and mantle civilians are the bad guys. How dare they be so mean to the people who strip their resources and colonized them. It's so dumb. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! Thank 
god, Rooster Teeth is shutting down. I really do not want to see them fumble the story of the poor bullied colonizers. After dropping the ball with their racism plotline, then with their PTSD plotline, then with their suicide plotline, why the hell would they try to touch another sensitive topic like colonization? We spent the last nine years painting Atlas as the big bad elites. Wasn't that the whole thing people were pissing themselves over with Ironwood? Ironwood was prioritizing the rich Atlas folk over Mantle? Well now, boo hoo, feel bad for those poor colonizers. Their orphan children are being physically attacked. They're just trying to feed the hungry children. They don't deserve to be treated so poorly. No! 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 Thankfully, at the beginning of this stupid epilogue of theirs, they have this little thing with Eddie and Carrie where they explain that if volume 10 gets made, this probably would be changed. There's still time for them to cut out this absolute dumpster fire of a plotline. Please, if anyone from Rooster Teeth can hear me, and if you are the ones who continue on to make volume 10, do not do a colonizer plotline. You won't do it good. I know you won't, cause you never do it good. Just don't touch it. Please, for the love of God, don't do colonization. Please. You would know what to do, sister. Whitley, you really should cover up. No. I won't hide forever. No, man. Like, you're the whitest kid I know. You're gonna get a sunburn. It's Crow, and he's surprisingly chipper about everything. Which, on one hand, I'm all on board with the idea of Crow finally getting a positive development arc for his emotional well-being. But also, I don't know, this should have happened after Team Ruby comes back. He should still be mourning the loss of his two beloved nieces. Everyone else is in turmoil still, so Crow's cheerful demeanor makes him come across like he didn't even care about Yang, Ruby, or any of them. Hell, even when Team Ruby comes waltzing back into his life, back from the dead, he has no reaction to it. No over-the-top smiles, no screams of joy, no tears of relief, just... Blank face nothingness. Maybe Crows doped himself up on uppers to keep the grim away. High as a kite, living his best life. And yet, you can still see the good in small things. All a matter of perspective. It sure is convenient he had this monologue next to the kids who were having fun and playing. It's a good thing he didn't do this when he was around the vacuans who were pelting orphans with rocks. Then Crow might come across as a little insensitive, huh? Wow, remember her message? Ugh, let's be honest, trying to paint Ruby as this bastion of hope, this new remnant Jesus figure, is incredibly dumb on multiple levels. First, her message sucked. Her message is the thing that has thrown the world into chaos. Hey everyone, there's a super ancient mega powerful demon witch coming to kill everyone in the most militarized country in the world. And the leader of that military is a filthy liar who can't be trusted. But maybe you all could come help us instead. Vacuo, come help the city who colonized you. Vale, apparently you're on the brink of collapse, but send all of your resources our way instead. But remember, don't panic. I'll admit, the Grimm have always been painted as chump change for the heroes. Literally, baby teenagers can kill these things en masse. But also, every time something horrible has happened to a place in Remnant, it's because of the Grimm. Beacon Fell, the end of Kuro Yuri. Hell, here! In this animatic, the Grimm are a problem. Ruby stapling on. But please, try not to panic isn't really going to be all that helpful. Second, this is literally all Ruby's fault. She's the reason Atlas fell. She's the one who used the staff to create Penny's new body, dropping Atlas. Yeah, she also made the teleportals, but she also is the one who decided to dump literally everybody into one location, Vacuo, which, as we've seen, has caused constant turmoil for the refugees, the citizens, and her friends. I don't think you need a crappy mural telling people to remember her. By all means, 
means the world should have no trouble remembering the harbinger of their darkest days. Oh look, Raven's here. The last time you two saw each other, you wanted to kill one another. But I guess it's all smiles now. Nothing can ruin the mood for doped up crow. Oh yeah, and Emerald gets shafted throughout this entire thing too. Great job. Hey everyone. So that's the Volume 9 epilogue. I know I had quite a lot of critiques about it, but honestly, this is pretty par for the course with Ruby. I'm so used to the desperately melodramatic moments being paired with the cartoonishly over-the-top scenes, so that's why in the beginning I call this whole thing mid. It's nothing new. And especially on a rewatch, it's mostly just dreadfully boring. Quite honestly, Volume 9 wasn't all that bad in comparison. Now that some time has passed and I've sat with it more, I can admit that the writing on volume 9 was a lot tighter. It's not great, obviously, but it was tightly put together, and we don't usually see that with Ruby. And this epilogue really hammers home why. Volume 9 cut out all the crap that usually plagues Ruby's scripts. The convoluted plotline, the barely developed world building, the millions of side characters the writers are desperate to figure out what to do with. Volume 9 cut out all of that and just had their weird Wonderland storyline. So no wonder it felt more tightly written. And we still have no idea what's going to happen with with Ruby? Yes, please, go ahead and keep on posting your millions of pointless hashtags. That's definitely going to do anything. Executives are really going to care about your hashtags on YouTube and Twitter. You're definitely gonna save Ruby one hashtag at a time. Wow. If Ruby gets picked up somewhere and we do get a volume 10, I hope they scrap most of this epilogue. Truly, there's nothing really worth keeping from this mess of ideas, except for maybe Nora dating Velvet and Neon. <laughs> no, I don't think we should do a colonization plotline where the colonized people are exclusively shown to be Disney levels of villainy. No, I don't think it's a good idea to wipe Vale off the map off screen and have everyone forget about Mistral and Menagerie's existence. No, Crow shouldn't be all sunshine and roses in the wake of Ruby and Yang's presumed deaths. No, I don't want Ruby Rose Jesus Superstar. Jeez Louise, good riddance rooster teeth. Good Witch of Beacon and Headmaster Theodore of Shade can verify all of this. What a wonderful kind of day to get along with each other. Well, they f***ing what? They're just saying hi to each other. <laughs> oh, they f***ing. Oh, they f***ing. Who the f are you? Who you is? I don't even know your ass. Surprise, bitch. I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. Shut up a second. Here. Shout out to my $10 patrons. You're all amazing. Andrew, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, Classy Critic. Noah Perkins, Sunny Shy, Jake, Amber, Hype Man, Zero to Hero, Isaiah, Scaring Crows, Messiah Complex, Jacob, Ben Sketchbook, The Watcher, Omega Fighter, Trash, Wild Pilot, Josh, Gino, Twisty, Juan, Bunkin' Duncan, and Alpha 99. Thank you for watching this. I hope you had fun with it. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, uh, making the video, not the actual epilogue. <laughs> what did you think of the epilogue? Did you like it? Did you care? <laughs> Was there anything worthwhile? And, uh, most importantly, if you can think of a better ship name for Nora x Neon, or if you can come up with a ship name for Nora, Neon, and Velvet, all three of them together, then hell yeah. B bonus. Extra. Good. Yes. <laughs> Any all thoughts and opinions, leave them in the comments below. I have a Discord. I keep forgetting to mentioning it. I have a Discord. <laughs> you have to be a $2 patron or above to be in it. I have one now. Thank you. I'll share all your thoughts and opinions, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>